again to the live stream. Good morning and welcome to the heart, everyone. Um, I'm going to start us this morning by reading a psalm. If you uh, have a, a Bible out, you could turn with me to it. If not, I'm, I'll be happy to read it out loud. Uh, this is Psalm 150, so it's the last psalm. I want to invite us uh, to, to enter worship with this psalm in our, in our hearts. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his high heavens. Praise him for his acts of power. Praise him for his surpassing greatness. Praise him with the sounding of the trumpet. Praise him with the harp and lyre. Praise him with tambourine and dancing. Praise him with the strings and flute. Praise him with the clash of cymbals. Praise him with resounding cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let me pray for us. God, thank you so much as we think about this psalmist inviting everything that has breath to praise the Lord. We, this morning, join the song that creation is already singing. You are good. You are a creator, and you love us. So, Lord, may we cherish that as we come to you, as we renew ourselves in your presence, as we await for your renewal in our lives. God, may we bring wherever, whatever we have, whatever's on our mind, whatever is on our hearts, we pray, Lord, that as we come to you, you would take these offerings and that you would turn them into something beautiful. So, Lord, as we sing this morning, would you meet us here in this place? Would we find ourselves closer to you and closer to one another? I sing your son's name, we pray. Amen. Would you stand and sing with us?
to the love that you have lavished on me. I cannot respond to the love that you have lavished on me. I don't have much. I don't have much. God of a Father, this day let it be known that you, Lord, are God of the present tense. Oh, Lord, Father of history, this day let it be known that you, Lord, Present in human things. Answer me, oh God. Let your people know you're turning your back to you. 
turning our hearts back to you. You are turning our hearts back to you again. Would you turn our hearts to you this morning? God, would you, would you allow us to feel the gracious invitation that you give us to turn towards you? Would you help us to feel you receive us in your gracious love, in your loving kindness, in your covenant faithfulness? Lord, receive us this morning. Build us up. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. All right, everyone, you can have a seat. Kids, come on up. Lydia's got some wild animals with her. <laughs> Good morning. Come on down, kids. Uh, so, as you're making way down, I'll go ahead and get started. So, last time we were here. Last time we talked, we came to the part of Daniel where King Darius has become king of Babylon. And 
It seemed to me like some of you kind of knew who King Darius was. What do you guys know about King Darius? Is any, he's a king. Yes, he is. Anything else? Does he? I, oh, well, I thought some people kind of recognized who he was. Well, uh, yes. Thank you. Yes, he was the king when Daniel was thrown into the lion's den. So <clears throat> today we are going to get along to one of the most well-known stories from the book of Daniel. It is actually going to be the last story from the book of Daniel that we're going to touch on. And it is where Daniel gets thrown into the lion's den. Now it's worth mentioning before we get into the story that at this point Daniel is actually a really old man. So when he first got to Babylon, he was very young, and now it's been a long, long, long time, and he's actually pretty old at this point. And so we've been rolling through the stories kind of quickly, so I just want you to know this has not all happened in like, you know, two years or, you know, he's old now. He's an old man. And so he's lived his whole life, basically, in exile here in Babylon, and he's been very faithful to God and very consistent in his faith, and we're going to see that in the story today. So with that, we'll go ahead and get King Darius up here. So come on up, King Darius. You've got a crown waiting for you. Give him just a moment. He's getting ready. All right, I do. All right so here's King Darius. And when King Darius came into power in Babylon, he chose three high officials to help him rule, one of which was Daniel. So I need two high, two high officials, so you can be a high official, and you can be a high official, and Jack, you can be Daniel. Okay? So come on up here, high officials. So King Darius set these three to help him rule over the kingdom. And he realized that Daniel was really exceptional. So King Darius, why don't you come shake Daniel's hand? Because he's extra good at what he does. Exceptional man. Now, that made the other two high officials really jealous. Can I see you guys frown and scowl and look mad? Excellent. And because they were jealous, they decided to try to find something wrong with Daniel that they could bring up to the king. But try as they might, they could not find any fault with Daniel. He hadn't done anything they could blame him for. So they thought. Can you guys show me thinking faces? Hmm. Yes. And after thinking for a while, they decided they were going to have to use Daniel's religion as a way to get him in trouble with the king. So... These two high officials, they go to King Darius. Can you go to King Darius? All right. And they said, King, why don't you make a law that anybody who prays to anyone or any god but you for the next 30 days should be cast into the lion's den? And the king agreed. Sorry, I'm looking at my notes here. And it would be unchangeable, this law, even by the king. And Daniel knew this law. Daniel, come here. Come here, Daniel. Okay, Daniel, even though he knew this law, the king has just decided, okay, there's going to be this law. Nobody can pray to anybody but me. Daniel continues to pray three times a day. Can you show me praying? Excellent job. And he prayed by a window that faced Jerusalem. Now, the officials can see him through that window. So they watch him praying, and then they go back to King Darius and say, King Darius, didn't you say that anybody who prays to anybody or any god but you should be thrown into the lion's den? And King Darius replied, The thing stands fast according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be revoked. And the two high officials say, well, this Daniel cares nothing for you or your laws, and we've seen him praying to his God three times a day. King Darius was very sad because he did not want to throw Daniel into the lion's den. He liked Daniel very much, and he thought all day about how he could save Daniel from the lions, but the law was irrevocable. It was unchangeable. Even the king, he could not take it back. And so at the evening time, the two high officials come back and they say, you've got to throw Daniel in the lion's den. Can you point at him really fiercely? Point like this, at him. Yeah. You've got to throw Daniel in the lion's den. 
So, King Darius realizes this is what he's going to have to do. So here's the lion, right? Okay. And here is what King Daniel or Darius said. May your God, that's to you, Daniel, may your God whom you serve continually deliver you. So he throws him into the lion's den, and he goes home, King Darius does, and all night he's worried about Daniel, and he's fasting, and he's praying, and he's hoping that Daniel is all right, and he comes back early in the morning to see how Daniel is doing. O oh, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve faithfully and continually, been able to deliver you from the lion's? And Daniel, who is okay, as you can see, he's perfectly all right, replies to King Darius. I'm going to stand by you and read this for you. He says, My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouths, and they have not harmed me because I was found blameless before him. And also before you, O king, I have done no harm. King Darius was very, very happy, and he wrote a decree saying, I make a decree that in all my royal dominion, People are to tremble and fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God, enduring forever. His kingdom shall never be destroyed, and his dominion shall be to the end. He delivers and rescues. He works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth, like a lion being safe upon a man's head. He who has saved Daniel from the power of the lions... Thank you very much. And everybody, you guys can have a seat right here. So uh, raise your hand if you've heard this story before, if you are familiar with the story of Daniel and the lion's den. Yeah, this is a pretty popular story because, hey, it's really exciting, right? A guy gets thrown into some lions, and he spends the night with them, and he lives. That's pretty exciting. Um, and God is the one who brought him through that experience. Now, it's kind of nice to end on this story because we see here, we're kind of back around to where we started with Daniel. He has continued the same way that he started out for all of these years. So when he came to Babylon, he was strong in his faith and he lived according to what he knew God wanted him to do. And here, much, much later in his life, he's still doing the same thing. He's still living the way God wants him to live, and his faith has not wavered. And I think it's just a really encouraging story. If you read the whole thing, you know, all together, it's, it's a great story in isolation, but it's a wonderful kind of capstone to this life that he has spent. And we continue to see not only is he living faithfully, but it's still having impact on those around him. He has impacted many kings in his life, and other people as well. And so I think the lesson that I would take from this last story here in Daniel is it's good and important not only to start out in the right way, but to finish strong too. And so Daniel is, he's not quite finished yet, but you can see that he's finishing strong. He's still doing the very same things that he started out doing. And so that's really encouraging for us because maintaining a, you know, a good, healthy faith through a whole long lifetime can be challenging. Um, so, you know, you can take that as a good, healthy example. And I'll pray here for us, and then you guys will go with Miss Kelly and Miss Sarah to the gym. Father God, thank you for providing us with examples of uh, faithful people in the Bible. Um, I pray that we can learn to be strong in our faith and consistent in our practice and, above all, rely on you for the strength that we need to make it day to day. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Lydia and Mike and volunteers. Mike, I think you have a future career in voice work, like voiceover, kingly roles. It's good stuff. Does he get to wear the crown? Oh, that's my <laughs>
<laughs> That's a personal matter, John. We'll just leave that alone. <laughs> Thanks so much, guys, for leading our kids faithfully week in and week out. I have just a few things to make us aware of this morning before we go to God's Word together. The first announcement that I have is a very exciting one, and that is that in case you haven't heard yet, our church family grew by three over the course of the last week. So let me try and get this right. You think keep me right if I mix up names. So baby Clay was born to Kyle and Stephanie Wiggum. Baby Lily was born to Glenn and Aaron Duell. And then baby Avery was born to Charlie and Chelsea Charping. So we have three new babies in our church family, yeah. We are thrilled for them. All babies and mamas are doing well. We do have meal trains that are set up for these families to help support them in these first days of welcoming a new member into their home. So those, the links for those meal trains will go out this week over the email. So look out for that if you'd like to jump in on supporting them in that way. If you don't get the weekly email, make sure you let me know about that. That is one of the main ways that we stay in touch about what's going on here at The Heart. So let me know if you'd like to be added to that distribution list and look for those meal train links this week. I also wanted to make sure you're aware of an event this week. It's an online event with World Relief. As you know, that is a developing partnership for us here at The Heart, both on the domestic side and the international side. So we've been doing a lot of work with the triad offices in High Point and Winston-Salem with World Relief, refugee resettlement, and some other pieces there. We are also developing a partnership with one of their global offices in Rwanda and just looking to the Lord for his guidance and how that develops over the course of these next weeks and months. So a lot of exciting things there. And there is an event this week on Tuesday, Tuesday morning at 10.30 a.m. There's an online Zoom event for all church partners that are partnering with the Rwanda office. So if you have an interest in this at all, in the work of World Relief in Rwanda and what that might look like for us at the heart in terms of partnering with them, this would be a great Zoom call for you to jump in on and just see what that looks like and feels like. So it's 10.30 on Tuesday morning. Again, we've sent that link out over, the, over our email to register for that. If you haven't seen that yet and you'd like to participate in this event, let me know. We'll get that link to you. You register and then jump on that Zoom call Tuesday morning. And please do keep that ongoing process in prayer. Like I said, there's some really exciting things happening both stateside and overseas with World Relief. So we'll take that a step at a time. And the last thing I wanted to mention is that on the 26th of this month, so Sunday morning, we are going to have our next church family meeting. So mark your calendars for the 26th of June. It's about two or three weeks from now. It'll be immediately following our church service, so we'll get started right around 11.30 or so. We do it that way so that people can participate online as well. So we'll have our church service as normal, and then we'll have our church family meeting immediately following here in the auditorium for those who want to come in person, and then we'll have it online as well starting at 11.30. So that'll be an opportunity to share some ministry updates, some financial updates, hear about where God is leading us over the next six months. It will also be a chance, God willing, to meet Mike's family, who should be with us by the 26th. Mike is heading out today to go meet Debbie and the kids and bring them back this way. So we're thrilled for you, man. Way to make it this far as a bachelor in Boone. Yep. But now it gets even better. We're, we're excited to have Debbie and the kids with us very soon. Uh, so it'll be a chance to meet them on the 26th as well. All righty. That's all I have, Mike. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Graham. Oh, my goodness. So we've been making our way through the book of Acts, and we're going to be in Acts chapter 9 today. And uh, to be honest, we've been taking some really big chunks of this book. And so I'm actually going to spread this series out longer than anticipated and just start taking smaller bite-sized chunks. Part of that is because it's hard to study two, three chapters at a time and give it justice. And the other part is I think that it's important for us to, to maybe slow down a little bit and, and really take in um, these, these sections a little more carefully. So today, I'm going to kind of jump into chapter 9, and we, 
we are going to cover the first 19 verses, and then I'm just going to summarize the rest of the chapter. And then Ethan next week will be in chapter 10. And, and then when I get back on the 19th with my family, we'll start the smaller, the smaller chunks. All right? Do you have any yeah buts? You know what I mean by that? A yeah but is one of those things where you can't see a positive future because of current circumstances or behavior. So in the case of our text today, we have a bunch of yeah buts, but for Saul, the yeah but is yeah but the Christians, right? I have this, this preferred life, this preferred vision of what life is supposed to be in orthodoxy as a Pharisee, but those Christians. For Ananias that we're going to encounter, his yeah, but is Saul. I want to obey you, God, but Saul, do you know who this guy is? And for the church, the yeah, but is, is this a trick? Is this guy Saul claiming to be a Christian just to get inside? God, you do transform people, but... And what we're going to see is that in every single person's life in this text, in 19 verses, the yeah, but changes from the circumstance and the behavior to, yeah, but Jesus. And I believe that that is the point. Because Jesus is able to reach any and every one when and how he wants to. And so if we live our lives with some sort of yeah, but, we need to bring that to God and allow him to transform that and replace the name or the circumstance in our original yeah, but with his name and his power and his authority. So let's get started. Verse 1, But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Okay. Saul is breathing threats and murder against the people of God. I'm not sure what that is, but I might have to switch to the handheld. If it goes one more time, we'll switch. Saul is breathing threats and murder. All right, that's the signal. We're good? Hey, I don't like this anyways. Saul is breathing threats and murder. I got to get my train of thought going here. And what that means for the Christians is that is we know they have been dispersed. And what we learn is that that Saul's zeal for stopping the movement of Christianity is the same. It's being compared to the zeal of Philip, who we learned about last week, who is committed to the spread of Christianity. So Philip has, has initiated the gospel in both Samaria, people who are supposed to be outside of God's kingdom, according to the culture, and also down into Judea, where he meets a eunuch, from Africa. And there's no problem with Africa, but there is, in the, in the legal code of the Jewish world, a prohibition against worshiping together with someone who is a eunuch. And Philip, and then the apostles learn that the gospel actually breaks all of those boundaries and barriers, and it goes, and it transforms and it is beautiful, and it is good, and they're rejoicing in this, but at the same time, you got Saul who's saying, 
it must be stopped at all costs because it has to be just what we want. If you aren't exactly like us, you do not belong. Orthodoxy is the only way. And if you don't agree, you can die. You can rot in jail. You thought I was going to say something else. You can rot in jail. And so he goes to the high priest. We don't even know if the high priest has any sort of jurisdiction to do this, but it, it can maybe dictate that these letters are kind of a, we need your help. Um, so, so Paul asks for these letters, and they're basically letters of extradition to go and gather up people who are found to be following Christ and bring them back to Jerusalem to be tried as fugitives of the law. And they'll be found guilty and they'll be put to death. That's the way it works in this time in the church's history. And we think about, if, if you think about that, if somebody came to the MLT and said, hey, there are some defectors from the way we do things, and, and they've, they've left, and I would like some sort of authority to go and get them and bring them back so we can punish them. None of you would be hanging around here, right? I hope. That's, that's beyond bizarre. That's what's going on here. They're going to the, to the religious leaders, the ones who are, who are to represent the people to God. And, and asking for letters of extradition so that we can try and punish, put to death, those who are defecting. And so he gets these letters. That's surprising. And he goes 135 miles one way to Damascus. That is a long walk. That is how far people have been now moving away from the threat of this man's campaign. 135 miles. And Saul is on his way with his team to find a rest extradite and punish the Christians. He's motivated by hatred. And his hatred is fueled by self-righteousness. That needs to sink in for us. If we have a false perspective of what righteousness is and it is found in ourselves and our ability to keep things right and perfect rather than the ability of Jesus, we are in danger of living out hate-filled lives on the basis of what we think is right. We see it in Saul who probably from his own estimation and probably from his peers is a good and righteous and upright man. We can't forget that. He's doing this for God. We can't forget that. God didn't ask him to. We can't forget that. That's important. And so he gets there. Or he doesn't get there. He, he gets close. Verse 3. Now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him, and falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice but seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And for three days he was without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Who meets Saul on the road? Jesus. Is Jesus afraid of Saul? 
No. But he also meets him in a spectacular way that none of us could ever meet him. I cannot make myself bright enough to blind a guy. I can't make myself bright at all. I'm not Dragon Ball Z. I'm sorry, that was a reference for the young kids. Oh gosh, I said that. Anyway. <laughs> I'm just losing it today. I'm excited to go see my family. That's my excuse. He's blinded by the light, and he hears a voice. Saul, who becomes Paul, will eventually say that he actually saw the person of Jesus in this instant of, of flash of light. And the question is, why are you persecuting me? Who's, who is Saul persecuting? He's persecuting people who have attached themselves to Christ. But what does Jesus use? He says, me. This is personal. This is not, why are you persecuting my people? This is, why are you causing harm to my body? Almost like it's an extension of the death he already suffered. And Jesus sees those who belong to him through faith in him as deeply and intimately part of him. Inseparable. Does that speak value to you? It ought to. You are not a possession of Jesus. You are part of how he sees himself. That is huge and beautiful and good. And why, oh, why, Saul, would you hate that? Why would you hate and hurt me? And Saul does not know this voice. Do you remember when Jesus used that parable about the sheep knowing the voice of their shepherd? I think it's important here that Saul does not know who is speaking. He, up to this point, has not actually encountered the Jesus. He's encountered the message of the gospel when he was watching Stephen die. We know that. But that message did not just automatically translate into him meeting the person of Jesus. And now he has... And he says, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Again, that intimate language. And he gives him some instructions. Go into town, go into Damascus, and wait. And Saul sits there blind for three days. And, and we have this language of fasting. He doesn't eat or drink anything. For three days... He just sits. What do you sit with? You sit with what you've done. And you sit with the person of Jesus meeting you on a road, asking you a hard question. And you sit with the reality that these are not legal killings, this is murder. And for as orthodox as Paul or Saul is, he has to know that there is no forgiveness for that. He has to know that the very thing he is trying to protect he is outside of it. He cannot get back in. The penalty for murder is to be stoned to death. So for three days, he sits with this. It's heavy. 
It's heavy. Have you ever been in a holy encounter where all of your yeah buts go away? You have no more excuses. Because Jesus has met you and touched right where the source is. I have. I've shared some of those stories. But when you find that you have been self-righteous, you have made yourself appear to be whole, but you are not, and then the brokenness and the hatred and the rage gets exposed and you have no excuse because the God who you think you're protecting has said you are actually hurting me. There are no yeah buts. And you sit. And you wait. It's a painful wait. It's a painful wait. Now there was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias. And we know from from. Saul's own testimony later in the book that Ananias had a reputation not just among the, the, the Christian church there but also among the, the Jewish religious as, religion as well as being an upstanding and devout man. This is someone who has integrity and character. And so Jesus goes to this person. Ananias And he said, or, and, and the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. And he said, here I am, Lord. This, this response is echoing Abraham and, and Jeremiah and Isaiah. This willingness to hear what God has to say. Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, rise and go to the street called Straight. And at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. I imagine Ananias might pause in his listening there. For behold, he is praying. And he has seen a vision, in a vision, a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man. This is Ananias' yeah, but. Lord, I have heard from, the, from many about this man how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. Here's Ananias. He's believed to, to be from this area. And he's a devout man. And now Jesus himself comes to him in a vision and says, Welcome to your nightmare. I want you to do something scary with a scary person. But notice that Jesus doesn't use any of that as his credentials for Saul. What are Saul's credentials? What does Jesus communicate to Ananias? He's praying, and I've been communicating to him through a vision. He is not beyond my reach, Ananias. Saul and I have been talking. And Ananias, he knows the reputation of this guy. And I know that we want, anytime somebody pushes back in Scripture, we want to throw them under the bus and we want to act like, oh, well, I would obey. No, you wouldn't. 
have you ever encountered someone who actually wanted you dead and then been told, I want you to go and pray with them and heal them and give them the Holy Spirit? No, we haven't. I mean, if you have, I would like to hear that story. I have not ever been in that situation where God came to me through his son and said, I want you to go and, and meet the person who wants you dead, and I want you to extend the gospel to them in a private room with no witnesses, right? I mean, this is, this is just scary to me. And it's scary to Ananias, and I think that's real and it's important because Ananias is a human. It is important for us to recognize that in the work of ministry, as we are moving the gospel forward, we must remember that Jesus is God and I am human. And Jesus is okay with our frailty and our fear. He's okay with that. It's disobedience that he has a problem with. And so he actually reassures Ananias. And he says, no, no, no. Understand this, Ananias. I've chosen him to do a special work. And in doing that special work of spreading the gospel beyond your ability, beyond your calling, he's going to, he's going to, to learn suffering too. Saul is going to become the target of his own hateful campaign. And people are going to live. And people are going to place their faith in Jesus. And 2,000 some odd years from now, there's going to be a church called the heart. And it's going to be full of people who, because of this yes to God, because you have allowed me to challenge your yeah, but Ananias, are going to be sitting there and learning your story and praising God and saying, okay, what are the yeah, buts that I need God to transform in me? That's the power of this moment. And it's beautiful. And when we have a yeah, but, we can bring that to God. And allow him to communicate to us. But I'm there already. Go with me. I'm there. And he does. Ananias does. He goes. So Ananias departed and entered the house. And laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you come has sent me so that you may re regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized. And then the human part gets taken care of too. And taking food, he was strengthened. No one, not even a terrorist against the cause of Christ, is beyond the reach and transforming power of Christ. No one. We say, yeah, but because we recognize our limitations. That is good, that is important. But those limitations do not limit the power of God. And so it's okay to acknowledge them. It is not okay to lean on them, to place your faith in our yeah buts. Our yeah, our yeah buts have to be translated into yeah, but Jesus. Yeah, but Jesus. I bet even right now you can think of moments in your life, in your walk, 
regardless of, of how long you've been walking or how short you've been walking, there are moments in your life where Jesus has transformed a yeah, but something that, that you had already determined cannot be good, cannot have a good outcome, cannot certainly be glorified. And then Jesus transformed it. Do you have those moments? If you look, you'll see them over and over and over because Jesus is in the business of taking trash and turning it into treasure. And I don't mean trash in terms of people. Please do not hear that. I mean circumstances, behavior, faulty thinking, hatred. Saul becomes somebody who is deeply loving. And I want to summarize the rest of this chapter. And the, the reality is, is that in the wake of this, Saul goes right to the synagogue and he starts to develop kind of his method for ministry. And he's in the synagogue and people are like, what? Is this the same guy who was coming to, to arrest us and possibly murder us? And he's now talking about Jesus is the only way? What happened? And they're coming to faith. But then, guess what? Immediately, days after Saul has been transformed, he becomes the target of the same kind of hatred and jealous rage. And he has to escape. And he escapes to Jerusalem, and then he gets to Jerusalem, and he is the ultimate outsider. He does not belong with the religious elite in which he left, and he is now feared by the church, and the church there has a yeah, but. They're not going to just take his word for it. Yeah, but is Saul trustworthy? That's the question. Is he just trying to infiltrate us and harm us? And Barnabas, do you remember Barnabas, the guy who sold his property and laid it at the apostles' feet? Barnabas becomes the mentor of Saul. And eventually they become ministry partners. And Barnabas goes to the church in Jerusalem and he says, No, listen to this incredible story. Listen to what God has done. Even Saul has been transformed. Our worst nightmare has turned into a beautiful reality. Because Jesus changed him. And Saul is welcomed. And there, yeah, but is transformed. Yeah, but Jesus. And then in Jerusalem, Saul becomes the target of his own hate-filled campaign and has to sneak out and be smuggled back to Tarsus where he can just kind of lay low for a while. He is now a fugitive in the system he set up. Learning what Jesus told Ananias, how much he must suffer for the cause. And then there's this little verse that I think is really important. Because you know what we do? This is, this is where our self-righteousness shows up. And I just want to be blunt. We often make statements like, the church in America would be more active if we would just face some persecution. Maybe. Maybe. But guess what? That's a yeah, but. Because the gospel is still true. It's still powerful. It's still the same Jesus. He's still in the business of transformation. So when we make statements like that, we're actually saying that it's times of peace and prosperity in the American church that prevent the gospel from having any sort of power. Here he goes. That's junk. It's bad theology. Because this verse, it smacked me in the face. Saul leaves, and verse 31, chapter 9, 
So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria, notice how big the church is, had peace and was being built up. Having peace and growing. And walking in the fear of the Lord. That's the key. Fear of the Lord. And in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it multiplied. The secret sauce is not in persecution. The secret sauce is not in peace. The secret sauce is fear of the Lord and comfort in the Holy Spirit. We've already talked about this. When we talked about how do we form a godly church, what do we do? And we try to, we try to, to copy the activity of people thinking that somehow that's going to create life. But life is born out of the Holy Spirit and our dependency upon him. And as we depend on him, he informs what we are to do, how we are to be, how we are to move and breathe and have our being. And so the church that is dependent on the Holy Spirit and not on its yeah buts is an unstoppable force because it's not about us. Jesus is still in the business of transformation. It may not happen just because we say a prayer. It may not happen because we build the gospel out in words. It may not happen because we had a program that we thought was going to be successful and it wasn't. It may not happen because we cooked hamburgers at an apartment complex. It will happen because the Holy Spirit says, I want to break through. And I'm going to use the people who are saying yes to me and no to their yeah buts. And when it happens, we get to be a part of that story. We get to walk into scary situations with Jesus, who has already been there before us. It's good. And so with Saul transformed, and now the focus all funneled in on him, right? And with him in hiding, the church is experiencing peace. Saul is being developed in his faith. And the church is still growing. And so Peter now has the freedom to move around like he didn't for the past several who knows how long. And we see Peter go and begin his ministry afresh. And he ends up in a place called Joppa. Which, am I right in saying we're going to hear more about Joppa next week? Yeah, yeah, I figured as much. Joppa is, is over on the coast. And it's, it will be familiar next week. But that's where Peter ends up because there has been a, a, faithful, um, a faithful woman named Dorcas who has fallen ill and passed away. And since Peter was close by, some, some messengers went up and got him. He came back and brought her back to life. And then more people came to Christ. And so Peter just kind of stayed there for a while. And that's where we end today. But I want us to remember this story is all about Jesus transforming our perspective, our excuses, even the ones based in reality, into something that we realize he can go there, and he does. What does it look like for us to invite Jesus into that space. To hear ourselves say, yeah, but. And then, like Ananias, to just acknowledge that to the Lord and then let the Lord speak to us. Okay, I hear that. 
You're anxious. You're afraid. I hear that. This is what I'm doing. I'm inviting you to join me, not to be me. I'm inviting you to join me, not to be me. We have to reframe our thinking. We have to allow the Holy Spirit to do that. And it happens in those moments. I don't, I don't know if there's a way for us to devotion our way into this. But I think we should be aware. We should, we should know that, that Jesus can handle and wants to hear our yeah buts and then he wants to transform them because he sees beyond them. And he actually has the power to do something about it. Can we do that together? Yeah. But Jesus, my favorite phrase. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for this story of awesome transformation. And I ask that you, your spirit, would be present in, in, in visceral ways, ways that we can f feel and, and see and hear and understand. And that we would step into what you're doing as you make it available to us. You are always at work. Help us to see and to hear and to move in those rhythms. Amen. Amen. Stand and sing with us.
Lord is my shepherd I shall not be in want He gives me Of his name. 